our second reading comes from the book of Luke, Luke chapter 1, from verse 57. No, 67. <laughs> Luke chapter 1, verse 67. His father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come and has redeemed his people. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he said through his holy prophets of long ago, salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us to show mercy to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath he swore to our father Abraham, to rescue us from the hand of our enemies and to enable us to serve him without fear, in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him, to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins, because of the tender mercy of our God, by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven, to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the path of peace. And the child grew and became strong in spirit, and he lived in the desert until he appeared publicly to Israel. We are traveling through the book of Luke. We having uh, just a glimpse at the life of Christ through the testimony of Luke. Now Luke was a Gentile, so he was like we are. We are not Jewish. We are not uh, a natural Jewish people. Um, and so yeah, this man Luke, who is a physician, who is a doctor, he's able to give a moment by moment account of what he heard uh, from the testimony of others, and then he would write it down and so we are going to be taking quite a while through the book of Luke. It's going to be maybe two or three years, so strap yourselves in. Yeah, we've seen the whole gamut of what God is going to be doing through um, these two babies that are going to be born. And right now we've seen the birth of the baby boy, John. The boy is born to Zachariah and Elizabeth. Both the prophecies in Isaiah and Malachi that we had a look at last week um, have come true. So then we ask, well, these men prophesied long before um, John would come or even Christ would come. The natural question then, what does it mean to be a prophet of God? What does it mean to be a prophet in the Old Testament? Um, well, I, I enjoy reading uh, a website called gotquestions.org. If you go on there and you type in a question, they give you a really uh, good answer and something that you can actually have a look at, and they give you lots of references, which is, which is wonderful. So I put in the question to them, I, I put in the question, what is prophecy? And this is part of what they gave me. To prophesy is simply to speak prophecy. Prophecy is the noun, and to prophesy is a verb. It's a doing word. Prophecy, uh, 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 a prophecy at its most basic definition is a message from God. We know that. As a prophet spoke, they spoke from God. God carried them through to say what he wanted them to say. So to prophesy is to proclaim a message from God. The one who does this is therefore called a prophet. Although foretelling is often associated with prophecy, revealing the future is not a necessary element of prophecy. However, since only God knows the future, any authoritative word about the future must necessarily, uh, out of necessity, be a prophecy that is a message from God. In the Old Testament, there were uh, prophets who simply spoke their divine messages to kings or to the people. We think of Samuel. 
We think of Nathan, Elijah, Elisha. Later, there came a series of writing prophets. These men would write things down, and we have them today in Scripture. These are the writing prophets whose messages are preserved in Scripture. We look at Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Malachi. Often, uh, quite often, the uh, prophets would preface their utterances by saying, Thus saith the Lord, or this is what the Lord says. The point is that God had communicated something to the prophets and they were speaking directly for him. So if somebody stands up and they're a prophet and they're a known prophet, you know that what they're going to say comes from the Lord himself. 2 Peter 1.21 says, For prophecy never had its origin in human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So he has a very important part of being a prophet. And prophecy, it comes from the Holy Spirit. These men have been carried along to say what the Holy Spirit has said to them. According to Deuteronomy 13, there are two signs that, uh, 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 that the person is a true prophet. First, he must not direct the people to false gods. A true prophet will not tell the people to go and follow after the Baals, the Moleks. Secondly, whenever a prophet says something about future events, those events must come to pass. We know in the, in the Old Testament, if they didn't come to pass, these prophets or so-called prophets would be stoned. They'd be killed because if you're not speaking for God, you're speaking against God. If a prophet promotes the worship of false gods, or his predictions fail to come to pass, then he is a false prophet. God would often give the prophet a message about something that would happen in the short term, and this would really justify and give him credibility for the more long-term messages. For instance, Jeremiah told the leaders of Judah that the nation would be conquered by Babylon. But another prophet, a charlatan named Hananiah, stood up and said the Lord had given him a different message and claimed that Jeremiah was not a true prophet. Jeremiah told Hananiah that within a year Hananiah would be dead and within a year he died, Jeremiah 28. The fact that Jeremiah could so accurately predict the future should have given his other words more credibility. So there we see in the short term we can see that this prophecy came true the long term, his prophecy, um, if it comes from God, must be true. In the New Testament, John the Baptist proclaims the kingdom of God and the Messiah on, uh, are on the scene and he identifies Jesus as the Messiah. And John often called uh, the last of the Old Testament prophets. In the rest of the New Testament, prophets are not mentioned very much. It seems the apostles fulfilled the prophetic role as they spoke directly and authoritatively for God. And their words are preserved today in Scripture. Ephesians 2 verse 20 lists the apostles and prophets as being the foundation of the church, with Jesus Christ as being the cornerstone. He is the one that everything else is built upon, is the Lord Jesus Christ. Prophecy is listed as one, is the gift, one of the gifts of the Spirit, Romans 12, 6 to 8. Of great interest today is whether or not prophecy continues or is ceased when the foundation period of the church was completed. 1 Corinthians 12 to 14 is the longest New Testament passage relating to prophecy. The church at Corinth was misusing the gift as well as the gift of tongues. One problem they had was that when the believers gathered, too many prophets were speaking and they were uh, interpreting their own prophecies. Paul says that at most two or three prophets should speak, and they should do so one at a time. Others should be careful, carefully considered and evaluate the prophet and what he says, 1 Corinthians 14, 29 and 31. Perhaps the best understanding is that some people in Corinth thought they were getting a word directly from God, but they could have been wrong. Therefore, they needed to submit their prophecies to the judgment of the church. 
So the church needed to understand who they were, where they came from, who the, the, the message was from. As in the Old Testament, if a New Testament prophecy was contrary to the sound doctrine of the church, then the prophecy was to be rejected. The instructions in 1 Corinthians 14 also suggest that a person should be cautious in speaking for God if revelation is extra-biblical. If it's something outside of Scripture, there is a problem because we've got nowhere to reference it. Bearing a message from God does not automatically place one in a position of authority. The potential prophet should humbly submit his or her message to the leaders of the church for confirmation. Paul's directive suggests that the gift of prophecy has already, uh, was already beginning to wane as an authoritative, authoritative gift at the time of 1 Corinthians when it was written. A preacher or pastor today fills a prophetic role to the extent that he proclaims and explains the written word of God. I am not a prophet. I will never be a prophet, and I don't believe there are any prophets today. But I have an incredible privilege of taking God's word, of taking this book and opening it up before you and explaining it. The pastor can confidently say, thus says the Lord, if he follows it up chapter and verse. Unfortunately, some pastors assume a prophetic mantle and make pronouncements that are not from God, but their own imaginations. And there's many of them. We have the, the great privilege of being able to uh, uh, go through the book of Daniel at the moment in our studies with the, with the men and the ladies. And it's been wonderful to be able to see Daniel as he gets given visions from God and then um, is able to proclaim that to, the, to, to uh, the king, whoever he was at the time. But then also to look not only f uh, a future to his day, but future even to our day, the things that would come true. So, back to the book of Luke, 67 to 80. Here we have Zechariah. He has just seen his son being born and received his voice back. After being silent for quite some time, around nine months, give or take, Zechariah now wants to glorify God for all he has done. Isn't that wonderful that this man, he doesn't whinge, he doesn't whine, he doesn't moan. As soon as he receives his voice, he wants to glorify God. John MacArthur in his commentary on this passage says the following. This passage is known as the Benedictus. Just like Mary's song of praise, it is sprinkled with Old Testament quotations and allusions to the Old Testament. There's a lot of pointing back to the Old Testament. When Zechariah was struck mute in the temple, he was supposed to have delivered a benediction to the people who were worshipping outside. They were waiting for the, um, the priest that would come out, who's just been given uh, the, 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 the incense and the offering that goes up to God, and he was supposed to come out and now pronounce a benediction. And that's kind of where we get our benedictions from. So it is fitting that when his speech is returned to him, his first words would be, an inspirational benediction, a wonderful benediction, a benediction befitting of the God he serves. And notice here that the benediction of Zechariah is in two parts. The first part is about the one who is faithful. It's about God himself, the one that has given the prophecy to Israel. The second part is about this baby boy. It's about John. This, this little, little ball of, of flesh uh, wrapped in a, in, 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 in a little cloth lying there at his mother's side. He would be the last prophet of the Old Testament. But before we start, can we pray and ask God, God's blessing on his message? Most loving Heavenly Father, we ask at this time you will plant your word deep within our hearts. We also ask that your spirit would do his work to make us more like Christ in holiness. We ask this for Christ's sake. Amen. So now we get to Zechariah's prophecy. As you approach this, this passage, 
I want you to be keenly aware that Zechariah was only able to prophesy in and through the Holy Spirit. It did not originate with him. Obviously, he'd, be, he'd just been struck dumb. He couldn't speak. And, and, and there was fear. There was great fear there. But he doesn't let that fear overcome him. He knows who he trusts. So he trusts the Lord. And yeah, we can see something incredible happen. Verse 67. And his father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesying, uh, prophesied saying, Notice how all those who are close to the boy, this little boy John, are filled with the Holy Spirit. Elizabeth, his mother, Mary, his aunt, both babies in the womb, and now Zechariah as well. It was different in those days. It was um, very different because today we receive uh, Christ, Christ transforms our hearts and God gives us the Holy Spirit. But in the Old Testament times, God would give his spirit to a person for a specific task. As we, as we see with, with a number of people in the Old Testament. King David was filled with the Holy Spirit. The first king of, of Israel, Saul, was given God's spirit. But when he sinned greatly, what happened? The spirit was withdrawn, it was taken away. It would only be after Pentecost the giving of the Holy Spirit, that believers, upon salvation, would receive the Holy Spirit. Notice what Scripture says about Zechariah in verse 67. He was filled with the third person of the Trinity and began prophesying. God's Spirit gave people what God wanted of them. He was filled with the Holy Spirit. Whatever comes out of his mouth now would be the express will of God as he testifies, as he prophesies. It's a combination of praising God and saying what John, his son, would do in the name of God. There was this enormous mantle that would be placed on John, on this little baby boy. Zechariah launches off into a hymn, a song of praise to the all-knowing, all-powerful always present God. Zechariah prophesied about the coming Savior who would bring back, redeem, buy back his people and would be proclaimed by his son John. All of the Old Testament prophecies were coming true. No wonder Zechariah praised God saying, verse 68, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel. Blessed be the one who not only chose Israel, but has sustained her up until the coming of the Messiah. Israel are his prized possession. They're his chosen nation. He was going to work through them. And it, but, but it wasn't just being for Israel, it was for humanity. Many times throughout the Old Testament, God has sent his prophets, his priests, his kings, his judges to save Israel. The same God, verse 69, has raised up the horn of salvation. What does this mean? What's this horn of salvation? This was a common expression in the Old Testament. The horn was a symbol of strength, incredible strength. Just think for a moment of a massive a bull, this, this massive, uh, just huge, I would say beef, um, uh, thing with two horns, these massive horns. Anything, any predator that would want to face a bull would think twice because he would put down his head and you would see these horns and it would be for defensive purposes. It would say that he's not easy prey. But you see, Jesus would be the horn of salvation. His name means Lord of salvation. So not only is, is, is he able to save, but he's able to keep the salvation that comes, uh, that the coming Messiah would offer is strength, triumph over enemies, and total power. Just like the horns on the altar uh, offered refuge and atonement, that's forgiveness of sins, so the Messiah would offer cleansing from sin through blood shed on the cross at Calvary. We all know that. That the, the, the cross of Calvary is, is the power that, 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 that we're able to see in the blood of Jesus Christ. That though he was slain, he rose once again. 
To fulfill another prophecy, Jesus was to come from King David's line. Both Jesus' mother and father came from different lines that originated in King David. Please do yourself a favor. Go home either today or or this week in your Bible reading and read. uh, Have a look at Matthew chapter 1. Have a look at the genealogy there. But then also Luke chapter 3. See the, the different lines that lead from King David to Christ. Notice that Zechariah prophesied that King David is called the Messiah's servant that he would be the servant of Jesus. God spoke about the coming Messiah through the prophets of old. I I had a look at Old Testament prophecies, and I only printed four pages of these prophecies. There's 23 pages of these prophecies. And they're, they're, they're amazing. They're incredibly amazing. And in those prophecies, we can see that Jesus, his origin, We looked at, um, I think it's Isaiah chapter 9, and it talks about that he'll be from old. But then you go to John chapter 1, and what does it say? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. We know of all those prophecies and how God has substantiated Jesus through all of those prophecies. God inspired men to speak by the power of the Holy Spirit, to write prophecy uh, uh, according to the nature of, the character, the power, the suffering, the dying, the rising of the dead, of the Messiah. It's all there. The only scriptures that haven't been fulfilled is Christ's return one day, his second coming. That hasn't happened yet, but it will happen. Scripture has put it forward that it will happen. Look at verse 71. Why give us this reassurance of the Messiah that is to come. Why give us this reassurance? Why, why, why put that down in writing? That we, those who serve God, should be saved from our enemies. The horn of salvation, strong and mighty, would be strong enough to save his own. If you are for Christ, you are at odds with the world. Please know that today. If you love the world and all the type of things of this world and you are trapped in this, this, this possession um, game that the world plays, you will be by nature at odds with Christians. These two worlds cannot come together. James 4 verse 4 says, Friendship with the world, its systems, its philosophy, the spirit of the age means hostility, enmity with, with God. You can't serve Satan and Christ at the same time. Notice Zechariah also says that God will save us from all those who hate us. God will do that. Why do they hate us? Well, because of Christ. Because we stand up for Christ. We follow Christ. He's our master, our Lord, our Savior, and we will follow him. They don't like being told that there are sinners in need of a Savior. And I know sometimes we don't like to be told that we are sinners. If we get trapped in a sin and people confront us on that sin, what happens? Our backs go up straight away. Me, a sinner? Never. Never. They don't like to hear about things like sins like abortion, homosexuality, fornication, rape, murder, greed, jealousy, gossip. This in scripture, as we read this, is called uh, synonymous uh, parallelism. You say the same thing, but in a different way. We are saved from our enemies and from the hands of those who hate us. God saves us through those uh, 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 by his mighty power. People are going to hate us because we belong to God and Christ and we obey His ways. We don't fit into this world. By us being saved from our enemies, it shows that, verse 72, the promise that God gave to those men who have gone before, who were men who followed God, would be extended to us as we follow God and are obedient to Christ. That same protection, that same love, that same grace will be extended to us. Zechariah then takes us back to the Abrahamic covenant found in Genesis 12, 1 to 3. According to the covenant, God gave protection and land to Abraham and his descendants as they follow God's path for them. 
as a sign of this boys would be circumcised on the eighth day to show belonging to God. They were to understand that they were part of the holy covenant sworn by God to Abraham in verse 73. We see God's part in the covenant, but what was the descendants of Abraham's part? Well, let's have a look. What part did the people have in this covenant? Notice verse 74, they would be delivered from the hands of the enemies. God would do that, deliver them. And, and secondly, they, uh, that they would serve God without fear. Thirdly, verse 75, in holiness, righteousness before him all of their days. God is the deliverer of his people. Yes, he would put prophets, priests, kings, judges in place, but God would be the one that would be saving them. He'd be doing the action through these people. The men and women, children who serve God, would have a reverence for God. A holy fear. Not a fear that would overwhelm them because they don't know this God. They know God. They know what He's like. They know His nature. They know His character. He's not a ruthless God like the other gods with a small g who would demand child sacrifice, who would demand prostitution, mutilation of their bodies. They knew who God was and what he wanted from his people. That was spelt out in Scripture. Because God is holy and righteous, he wants his people to be the same. He expects them to be the same. Honest, true, God-serving, right, set apart for the will of God alone. So here we now shift from the focus of of who God is. Now the focus is going to be on the coming prophet, this little child, the servant John. Verse 76, and you child, even though John would only be about eight days old, God now speaks and it is recorded. Zechariah's son John would be called the prophet of the Most High. Little, little John, this little baby in this, this uh, cloth wrapped around his little body, would someday be the one who would speak on behalf of God to his people about the Messiah who would draw people back to God. People were going their own ways. Understand that there was 400 years of silence. We have a look at Zechariah. And he had nine months or so of silence. But can you imagine 400 years of nobody hearing anything from God? What was John's purpose in life? Number one, to go before the Lord to prepare the way for the Messiah. And two, verse 77, to give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins. This is so important for him to instruct, to educate them where they stand and where they need to be. A new teaching was coming that a man who was God in the flesh would offer salvation to the people and it would result in the forgiveness of sins. This was only done by a priest. He would go and he would offer up sacrifices and, 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 and because God said to them that this was the act that was, what was to be done, they would do it year after year, day after day. They would offer up sacrifices. But there would not be a real assurance of salvation. But here we have God in the flesh would offer salvation to the people and it would result in the forgiveness of sins. Priests were no longer needed. Christ would be the priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. He would be the lamb without blemish who would be sacrificed for the sins of the people. Not just for that time, but for all all time until he returned once again. This is the best news ever. Some would ask a question. Why would God do this? And that's a, that's a good question. Why would God do this? He's not really obligated. He could have taken the world and, 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 and squashed it up like, like we take a piece of paper and thrown it in the bin and start it all over again. That would be, I don't know, maybe that would be the way that I would do it. He would do this because this is his nature. 
He is the constant giver of grace. As we look to uh, Israel before, He's the constant giver of His Spirit, His tender Spirit, wanting all flesh to come to Himself. Will all flesh come to Himself? Will all flesh be saved? The answer is no. We know that. Notice what God says from the mouth of Zechariah, verse 78. Whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high. This is a messianic reference used in Isaiah 9, um, Isaiah 60 and Malachi 4. God's one and only Son will leave His place in heaven, will leave His privilege, will leave the angels in heaven and make His home here on earth, in the flesh, to shine God's glory to humanity who have been walking in darkness. A great light, the great light is about to shine. So this great light, verse 79, will give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death. Death was always a shadow that hung over the people, knowing that they were not sure what would happen after death. You see, it would only be once Christ would rise from the dead that they would realize that death is, is, is only uh, something we walk through to get to eternal life. You see, but now, having forgiveness of sins, they can now know the way of peace. God would save his people through the Messiah, and they would have peace with God because of Christ. Then lastly, verse, eight, verse 80, John grew and became strong in spirit. And he was in the wilderness until the day of his public appearance to Israel. God strengthened John, made him grow, made him understand what Scripture is all about, made him understand the Old Testament, the prophets, and, and how um, the priestly lineage would then culminate in who Christ is. God strengthened him, kept him free from the world and its influence when he was in the wilderness until he would start teaching about the kingdom of God and the way of salvation. As we've read this, as we've looked at this passage, I want, I want you to see today um, that God's faithfulness to mankind by sending his Messiah to be our substitute is where we are right now. We've just celebrated uh, uh, Easter. We've just seen the, the death, the, the, the murderous death of Jesus. We've seen him suffer. We've seen him die. But we've seen him rise from the dead as well. That's God's faithfulness to mankind as he sent the Messiah to be our substitute. He took his, our sin upon himself. He took all our sin in those three hours on the cross. We don't deserve it, but he still gives it. Understand that you do not deserve it. I do not deserve it. It's been 2,000 plus years and God still offers that same grace. Let God's Spirit change you today to be men and women who shine the light of Christ to the world in darkness. I love that first uh, interview, the first uh, testimony. He was in a place of darkness, wasn't he? And yet the light of Christ shone there through a Gideon's Testament. Grab a couple of the Gideon's Testament. If you need more, let us know. We'll get more. Let's shine God's light where we are today. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for Zechariah. Thank you for John. And as we go over the next couple of weeks, months, maybe even years, and we read about how you uh, instilled your spirit, not only in John, but in many people since then, I pray that you would do that today in our hearts, our minds, our lives. Make us bold. Let us see that salvation is in you alone, and let us preach that. Father, help us as we encounter friends, family. Give us the words to say. Help us to say it with confidence. For Jesus' sake we pray. Amen.